Amen. Appreciate that. Uh, welcome. I'd like to turn to the book of Ecclesiastes, but I'm... <laughs> I said, how can I make it work? But I can't. And so let's go to the book of Acts, <laughs> chapter 5. Acts, chapter 5, verse uh, 12. And appreciate the ministry uh, this morning, last night, obviously, and looking forward to the rest of the week. Ecclesiastes, uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Acts, chapter 5, and verse number 12. A local pastor was looking for a design for his new church building. And so one architect said he had a design, the perfect church building, perfect for both pastor and people. The pastor asked what made the design so perfect for the pastor. He said, well, on entering the auditorium, there is only one row of chairs right at the back. People obviously take their seats back there, but as soon as the row is full, it automatically moves forward to the front of the church and another row of chairs appears from the floor behind it. Uh, this continues until the building is full. And what makes the building also perfect for the people? He said, well, right behind the pulpit, there's a trap door in the floor. The moment the pastor's sermon goes over 30 minutes, the trap door opens and the preacher falls through, uh, guaranteeing the service always ends exactly on time. Now, I do want to preach on the perfect church this morning. And uh, just a simple challenge from the book of Acts, uh, uh, not uh, building design, not rows of seats, certainly not trap doors uh, for long-winded preachers. But I do want to preach from the book of Acts. Uh, and I believe what God has put here in the, uh, the original church to help us to design our congregations on the perfect church, Acts 5, verses 12 through 16. The Bible says these words, and through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people. They were all with one accord in Solomon's porch, yet none of the, the rest dared join them. But the people esteemed them highly, and believers were increasingly added uh, to the Lord multitudes of both men and women, so that they brought both men and women, so they brought the sick, sorry, out of the streets and laid them on the beds and couches, that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them, also a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all healed. Let's look first of all and consider for a few moments the untarnished church. Uh, one man had been described by his church friends as a pillar of the local church. And so he looked up the word pillar in his A to Z of Christianity, yeah? And the description says a big, thick thing that holds up everything and restricts the vision of others. <laughs> now, our text gives us a better description of what it means to be a pillar or one of the core members of your local congregation in this ground zero church. It describes three specific things. Number one, the Bible says that they were an outreaching church. Say outreaching. They were outreaching, that text says, in Solomon's porch. A little, uh, little uh, design of the temple there. There were typically four courts uh, around the temple. Uh, uh, there was the courts of the priests, uh, then the courts of the Jewish men, uh, then the courts of the Jewish women. Uh, and last of all, it was the court of the Gentiles. It was in the court of the Gentiles where Jesus did most of his uh, uh, temple preaching. He, he saw that as the greatest opportunity for outreach was right there uh, in, in view of the temple uh, in Solomon's porch. Uh, he preached there. Uh, he taught there. He healed there. It was maximum impact. Uh, and the Bible says the early church would go back to that same place, uh, Solomon's porch, uh, a shaded area around the court of the Gentiles. Uh, this might be your local mall. Uh, this might be your local shopping center. Uh, this might be going door to door, whatever it might be. Uh, but the Bible says the church at ground zero, uh, they were an outreaching church. Uh, they found the most effective place to outreach, and that's where you would find them. The second thing is the Bible says there was supernatural. There were signs and wonders. There were things that could only happen through prayer and faith in Jesus Christ, just like Pastor preached last night. There are things this morning that you can't do. 
that only God can do. And the Bible says this congregation, these pillars, these core believers uh, were contending for those things that can only happen through prayer uh, and faith in Jesus Christ. We're in chapter 5 of the book of Acts. The Bible speaks about the first four chapters are a record of the Holy Ghost moving. There's an outpouring of the Holy Ghost. Peter preaches what would best be described perhaps as an average to good sermon. Yet 3,000 people get saved. A lame man that's been lame for many years gets up off the ground and begins to walk. There's incredible liberality. People give everything. Forget about last night's offering. They just put the whole lot in. Incredible liberality uh, and even the supernatural uh, of God removing people who weren't liberal from the congregation. God not just moving, but God can also remove, can you say amen, uh, in the congregation. And the third thing, the Bible says they're all in one accord. Now there'd be uh, a case to be said that this should be in the supernatural area. Uh, and not just in a group on its own, but the Bible says they were all in one accord, that everybody in the congregation uh, uh, were on the same page. They all wanted the same thing. They wanted souls. They wanted the supernatural. They wanted the church to grow. Uh, and they're all in synergy, in one accord in that place. Uh, that's a, a record of the kind of church there in the New Testament. In every congregation from time to time, and as time goes by, there are two groups of people. One group wants to be in harmony with the flow of ministry in the local church, and there's another group, whether small or large, they want to plant their flag over every little thing that upsets them that week. Don't be in that group. The New Testament church, uh, a a, a global reaching uh, uh, church like in the New Testament here, they're all on one page. They weren't planting their flag over every little issue. Uh, Amen. Uh, And the Bible says that out of this, the church began to grow. Uh, It's the untarnished church. Warren Wiersbe says the local church was now unified and magnified uh, and therefore it was multiplied uh, It's the untarnished church. There's a second thought this morning. That's the unexpected choice because right in the middle of our text, uh, in one sense, a little bit hidden away, uh, there's a group of people that make a kind of an unexpected choice. Read a story about a guy called Joey. Joey worked at a five-star hotel and uh, he was sick of his boss that his boss was heavy-handed and so he was sick of his boss uh, And so uh, I guess not thinking too clearly about it, uh, what he decided to do was to smuggle an entire brass band into the building uh, where his boss had his office. (laughs) And he had his resignation letter there. He snuck the entire brass band in there. They got up to where the office of the boss was, uh, knocked on the door, you know, the boss comes out, uh, and then the brass band begins to launch (laughs) in. And uh, he hands his letter over in his mind. This is just, this is smart thinking. <laughs> what I think, and they got the people there recording it, you know, they're uploading it, live streaming and putting it on uh, Instagram and YouTube. And he marches out of the building, the boss is upset, they're <laughs> down the stairs all the way through there. Uh, he resigned with a bang. The problem was Joey's resignation video was viewed some 10 million times in his local city. (laughs) Joey didn't think it through too clearly. (laughs) Joey can't find a job. (laughs) But at least he got 10 million views on his video. So the untarnished church, though, they didn't make that kind of dumb decision. They're a soul-winning church. They're a supernatural church. They're in synergy. Yeah? And you would think, I would think, that any clear thinking person would choose uh, to get on board with what God was doing. But right in the middle of our text in verse number 12, the Bible puts this little verse in there, uh, yet none of the rest dared join them, uh, but the people esteemed them highly. This is an incredible human dynamic. 
that there was a group of people and the indication is perhaps they were remotely linked to the congregation, remotely linked to the church. They see what God is doing. They're aware uh, personally. They admire deeply what God is doing in that group of people. As a matter of fact, they approved highly, yet they chose not to join that group and to somehow stay just slightly out of the flow of what God was doing. That's an incredible mindset. I like what you're doing. I see what God's doing in your life. I see the results and the fruit of all that's going on, yet I myself uh, am not going to join them. So why wouldn't people join? Why wouldn't they just get in on what God was doing, uh, be done with debate, uh, be done with you know, planting your flag over this? Why wouldn't they just get on board? Well, I'm glad you asked. I'm going to help you out this morning. A <laughs> couple of reasons why they perhaps didn't join when they should have. One of those is a lack of gratitude for all that's gone before them. You know, we enjoy today many things because of the sacrifice of people who've gone before us. Can you say amen? amen. We just celebrated Anzac Day. And I, every good citizen that remembers Anzac Day, the, we are the beneficiaries of incredible sacrifice, not just those that died on the front line or those wounded on the front line. Uh, there are the families of those uh, uh, that were there on the front line, dead or wounded. Uh, there's an incredible debt of gratitude that we owe as a nation, those who've gone before us. Uh, but that's also true of churches. That's also true of fellowships. That's true of local congregations. We are the beneficiaries of people's sacrifice before us, and there ought to be some gratitude and appreciation. One man said, we see further today because we're standing on the shoulders of giants that gone before us. And the Bible says there are some people, they enjoy the benefits of what's been provided for them, but with no sense of responsibility and no sense of gratitude or appreciation. And for many people here the, this morning, and maybe those that watch this stuff uh, online, uh, our fellowship and your local church has just kind of always been there. You got saved into churches. You got saved into buildings. You got saved into ministries. And yet ungrateful for what's gone on to get that congregation to that place. Ungrateful for those who've gone before. You know, Pastor Scott's saying he's been 30 years in Adelaide. He deserves a Medal of Honor <laughs> for being in Adelaide. <laughs> <laughs> he deserves a Medal of Honor for faithfulness. Uh, for the, there are people that walk into his church and say, well, this, this all that's happening, is it? Not recognizing all that's gone before. That's a borderline personality disorder. If you can walk into your congregation and be there in, in whatever size or stage or season that it is uh, and not have a sense of appreciation for that, uh, you need a mental health check. Something wrong with you that you're going to be the beneficiary of those things and not sense any responsibility or gratitude. And gratitude ought to be that I want to be a part of this. I want to join this uh, and pass it on to another generation. And one of the first times I was going to America on a fairly regular basis every couple of years for a conference, and it always used to, I guess, bemuse me to some degree. Then it began to upset me, yeah? And that was the people that would go to America that would argue at that point, I guess, be the strongest nation in the world at that time, eh? and yet they'd, they'd, they'd be invited to come. They'd become citizens of the country, eh? but then pick on the country. Hang on a minute. What gives, you the, what gives you the right? You're there. It's the lucky country. You would think you would participate preserve and promote the country, but no, all you see is what's wrong. 
All you see is the negative. How come this, this group's not getting their share? There's something wrong with that. That's not just America that happens in England. It happens in Canada. It happens in Australia. You have people risking their necks to come and live your life and all you can do is, is grumble about small things you can't have. Borderline personality disorder. <laughs> you know, Kerry Packer is James Packer's father. He's a media mogul from the 70s and 80s. He had a heart attack in 1990. And the attending ambulance back in 1990, 30 years ago, resuscitated him with a defibrillator. And so uh, uh, Kerry Packer was so grateful that when he found out that not every ambulance in New South Wales could afford a defibrillator, he called the Premier and said, I want to, I'm so grateful for having had my life saved by a defibrillator. I want one of these in every, uh, uh, every ambulance and I'll pay whatever it, whatever it takes. They called it the Packer Wacker. And uh, <laughs> so here's a guy and I don't know, I don't know, you know his background. He's not a church going man. He's a very hard living sinner type of guy, but recognize it. I've been the beneficiary. I've got to have some gratitude to participate in those same things. In 1982, a young man gave me a flyer in Desperado's Tavern. Just gave me a flyer in Desperado's Tavern, invited me out to a gospel concert. Uh, he gave me a flyer. And out of that, uh, my wife is saved. I get saved. My kids are saved. Uh, there's a whole little uh, a group of little Walshers running around uh, uh, there. Uh, uh, you know, uh, got, a, got a brain because of that. That man gave me a flyer. It's only right I would ask somebody else out to a concert. Somebody witness to you. Do you have any sense of responsibility to share that good news with somebody else? Well, I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. Why should I? Because you should. <laughs> Went to the Potter's house in Bunbury. There was an outreach movie on. The church was on the streets passing out tracks for a movie. There was an impact team down from Scarborough in those days on the streets. And I went along to that outreach. Somebody invited me to that movie. At that place, I got saved. And so since then, I mean, we go to the streets. We have impact teams. We go on impact. It's only right that you've been the beneficiary of those things, uh, there'd be gratitude you'd pass those same things on. Uh, amen. Somebody witnessed to you. Somebody's paid their tithes to have a building and an outreach and so that you got saved. Why well, it be right that we would respond in gratitude, in kind. Can you say amen? For all but a small handful of people, your church has been provided for you. You've never had to be in a hall. You've never known the pure joy of set up and pack down three times a week. <laughs> the exquisite joy of raking out the rubbish and mopping up the vomit. <laughs> Trying to put some smelly crystals in the carpet to, you know, to somehow overpower the smell of baby poo or something that's in, I don't know what's in there. You walk into a building, you've never enjoyed the nervous wait for somebody to come as a visitor. <laughs> Not to a concert, I'm talking to a church service. <laughs> You're the nervous walk out the front, just kind of. <laughs> Have I raked and mocked for, <laughs> mopped for no reason? <laughs> My son, Pastor Josh, mentions about pioneering in Maroubra. And they'd set up the building, uh, you know, raked and mopped and all that sort of stuff. And uh, he's there, he's up the front and he's got the guitar. And so service time has come and started. So he's going to sing the first song in case somebody walks in, there's nobody there. His wife has taken his son to the 
kitchen or something to change a nappy and so some guy just wanders in the back door. <laughs> Way in the distance is just one guy on a guitar, about 30, 30 or 40 seats, you know, the magic number of unbelief and they're all... <laughs> You've, you've not lived until you've just played the guitar and seen the visitor come in the back and just look around. <laughs> and then say, is this it? <laughs> well, there's, we, we think there's more coming. <laughs> <laughs> no, you walk in, you low crowd today, Pastor. <laughs> I don't think there'd be a hundred here. It's like, <laughs> slap his lips off. <laughs> now there's a building, there's nursery, there's Sunday school, there's concert, there's air conditioning. There are people, you put your dozen kids through nursery and never do a nursery session. Oh, come on. Can all the pastor's wives say amen? <laughs> your, your kids come in and haven't been fed, the nappy hasn't been changed since last Sunday that you changed it in nursery. <laughs> Never do a session. Put your feral lot through Sunday school and never <laughs> volunteer, I could go on. Matthew 10, 8 says, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out. Freely you have received, freely give. One of the most distasteful and disturbing stories I believe in all the Bible happens in the life of one of its heroes, King Hezekiah. King Hezekiah is terminally sick. God, uh, God himself, not the doctor, but God himself says, my friend, get your house in order. It's time for you to receive your promotion into heaven. And Hezekiah, the Bible says, prays uh, and God grants him 15 extra years. You would think, you would think that would change a man's life. Second chance, 15 extra years. This is an incredible opportunity. What Hezekiah does is he loses his cotton picking mind. Lest the Philistines through, they check out the place. He's bragging about this. He's bragging about that like he built the place. Prophet, Hezekiah, Prophet Isaiah comes and speaks to him in 2 Kings 20, verse 19, and tells him everything's going to be lost here. They're going to come in, the Babylonians are going to come in, they're going to take everything, and your sons are going to be eunuchs. Listen to what Hezekiah says. 2 Kings 20, verse 19. Hezekiah said to Isaiah, the message you've given me is from the Lord and it's good. For the king was thinking at least there will be peace and security during my lifetime. That just disturbs me. You could be the beneficiary of such, such grace. And so well, I'm going to be a receiver, never be a giver, uh, some didn't join, I think, because they had lacked gratitude. The second reason they didn't join is because there's some people that are crowd pleasers and fence sitters. These are yes men and yes women who refuse to see any of life in black and white. I tell you, sometimes life's black and white. It either is or it isn't. No gray area. You know, no balance, if you like. It's heaven or hell, no purgatory. You're either saved or you're unsaved. No middle ground. It's just exactly what it is. No middle ground. You're either in or you're out. Jesus says you're either for me or you're against me. Yeah, but I like what you do. You're either for us or you're against us. No middle ground. You're either gathering with us or he says you're scattering abroad. No, it's black and white. It's clear cut and so, you don't like that. A lot of people don't like it's clear cut. You're either loyal or you're a rebel. Well, I like some things and you know, other things, black or white. And if you choose this, you're gonna offend some of that crowd. And if you choose that crowd, you're gonna offend some of this crowd. No middle ground. A lot of people don't like that. 
Galatians 1.10, Paul says, obviously I'm not trying to win the approval of people, but God, if pleasing people were my goal, I would not be Christ's servant. Not only is Christianity many times black or white, genuine Christianity also means we're oftentimes in the minority. If you think sometime we're going to be the, you know, the crowd favorite, being a born again Bible believing Christian is going to make you the crowd favorite. I've got, I've got tragic news for you this morning. <laughs> you're never going to be happy as a Christian because you're never going to be in the majority. We live life on a narrow road, walking through a narrow gate, while the crowd is going through a wide gate that leads to destruction, no middle ground. Sometimes you have to make a call that's going to upset some people. You have to make a decision. You have to join the core, the main players, the pillars. And that means upsetting some other people. When, we, uh, when my wife first got saved, uh, our best friends at that time, they'd been best friends for our, for, of ours for quite some time. Anne got saved. I didn't get saved. And uh, Anne wanted to call her best friend on the phone and, uh, and tell her that she'd become a Christian. And so Anne called her and uh, got her on the phone and uh, said, I want to come over and have a chat to you. And this girl said, well, that's odd. You just, just come over. What do you mean you're rigging me up, making a formal thing? Just come over. And Anne goes, well, I'll come over and have a chat, but I, 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 you might not like what I've got to say. This girl goes, there is nothing that you could say. <laughs> there is nothing you could tell me. Nothing you could say that would upset me. Pause for emphasis. Unless, of course, you're going to tell me you've become a born-again Christian. <laughs> and Anne goes, that's exactly what I'm going to tell you. <laughs> and they go, well, why? No! <laughs> you're going to get some of that. Yeah. Is this good news this morning? <laughs> you have to get a stomach for that from time to time. There are whole churches, they're an industry of pleasing crowds. No morals, no preaching from the Bible, no standards, no church discipline. And my greatest fear, no people going to heaven. They're simply on the wide road leading to destruction. Whole industries. Leonard Ravenhill that if Jesus had preached the same message that ministers preach today, he'd never have been crucified. Martin Luther King Jr., there comes a time when one must take a position that is neither protected, nor prudent, nor popular, but he must take it because his conscience tells him that it is right. That great theologian, Lecrae, says, if you live for people's acceptance, you will die from their rejection. Fence sitters and crowd pleasers. The last one is the unwillingness to sacrifice. If you're going to live for a God, there's a sacrifice involved. And some people are just simply unwilling to pay any kind of price. Someone spoke about witnessing to somebody who says they'd tried Christianity and it just wasn't for them. And their response was, it's not been tried and found wanting, it's been found difficult and therefore not tried. And for many people, the only reason that you don't put it all in is because of sacrifice. Remember our text comes quite close on the tales of uh, Ananias and Sapphira who lied to the Holy Ghost. God killed them. 
And uh, at that point in the early church, all of a sudden, man, this is getting very real. <laughs> this whole Christianity thing is becoming very, very real. And it's nice when there's a, a flavor of, you know, everybody likes us and it's good for you. Uh, uh, but there's going to come a time when it's not for everybody. And there's going to be a price to pay for going all in for God. Uh, and some are unwilling to sacrifice. There's scrutiny. These guys were held accountable for their life. There was the challenge to liberality. We're going to see offerings this week and in your church, no doubt, every service and times of pledges and offerings, uh, there's liberality that's needed. There's integrity. Uh, uh, these guys were not men of their word. All of it goes on uh, an unwillingness to sacrifice. Steve Jobs developed pancreatic cancer, but he refused to get an operation. He said, I don't want my body to be opened. I don't want it to be violated in that way. And as they begin to describe that and talk about that in history, they said whether stubbornness, fear of pain, or his love for alternative medicines, nothing worked. So after nine months, Jobs agreed to the operation. It had spread and it was too late to save him. He said, I don't want to pay a price. I don't want to pay a cost. I don't want to Make the effort, that cost. I close one final thought, then we're going to pray. That's the unequal challenge. For those who truly join in, and if you read our text again, I won't belabor the point. Uh, it talks about, you know, signs and wonders, and they're outreaching at Solomon's porch, and there's uh, miracles and so forth. Uh, has this little phrase in the middle about this group of people uh, that refuse to join them. Uh, but the Bible goes on to say, verses 14 through 16, uh, that men and women increasingly were added to the church. The Bible speaks about miracles and miracles. We're peaking. The, uh, the Bible speaks about the shadow of Peter uh, passing over sick people and them being healed. The church goes on to have a, a tremendous outreach, a tremendous revival, a tremendous impact and tremendous fruitfulness uh, because people did join. People were drawn from the surrounding cities. The sick were healed uh, and the demon possessed were delivered. Uh, and that's the challenge this morning. Is that if you would go all in, Single people here, there are married couples, there's young married couples with kids, uh, there are middle-aged people, there are some with a little snow, if there's any roof, they've got some snow on the roof. Uh, uh, all groups of people uh, with your own different choices to make. But my Bible says that if you'll make the right choice, that kind of ministry and impact uh, is yours for the taking. But without that, Without those kinds of choices, uh, then you just uh, sentence yourself to mediocrity for the rest of your life. Lots of places you can go, but the Bible says you've got to join. About 150 years ago, a band of brave men and women became known as one-way missionaries. They bought one-way tickets to the mission field, and instead of suitcases, they packed their few belongings into coffins said their goodbyes knowing they were unlikely to ever return home. A guy called Peter Milne was one of those missionaries. He sailed off to the New Hebrides in the South Pacific, uh, aware that the headhunters that, that had, there had martyred every missionary before him. Uh, he spent the next 50 years there. When he died, they buried him in the middle of the village uh, and inscribed this on his tombstone. When he came there, when he came, there was no light. Uh, and when he left, there was no darkness. That can be your testimony on a city, on a nation uh, this morning. Let's bow heads, going to close in a word of prayer. Heads, but eyes are closed. God, help us this morning to be people that really think this stuff through. Read their Bibles and see these little pivot points that lead to great blessing, great fruitfulness, impact, the supernatural. Those, uh, those crossroads, making the right decision, making the right choices, uh, 
Amen. This morning we've had some tremendous preaching. Uh, we've had Pastor Plummer speaking about the roller coaster of ministry life and any preacher or anybody close to ministry in their local church understands uh, uh, the roller coaster. Maybe God challenged you about the end result of that and ending up, um, there's an end to all of that. Uh, uh, Pastor Chirac, excellent ministry on the seasons of ministry life and that life has its seasons. Sometimes, it, sometimes you're up, sometimes you're down. Uh, and uh, the challenge that you would find a sense of contentment that in the providence of God, you find yourself in your current season, not resigning yourself to being there for the rest of your life, uh, but a sense of contentment as God moves you through that season onto better seasons ahead. Uh, and I've spoke a little bit about joining the early church, the challenges that they had to overcome. And this group of people, this kind of an odd group of people that, uh, that saw it. I recognize it. I understand it. I see what God is doing and yet make a choice not to be a part of that. And my challenge this morning to this group of people, perhaps those that are going to watch it uh, on live stream or in their churches and so forth, uh, that you would be a jo you'd join just like this group of one-way missionaries, you say, you know what? Uh, I don't want to be ungrateful for what God has provided for me. I want to be a part of it. Uh, I want to promote it. Uh, I want to get other people involved. I want to make it better than it is. I have gratitude for what's gone before me. I don't want to be a crowd pleaser, an offense sitter. Whatever the cost is, I'm going to make choices, clear cut decisions, not trying to offend people, not trying to put people offside, not just deliberately being belligerent. But sometimes you just got to call it as it is. Let the chips fall where they may. And the Bible says God recognizes that. And His favor is upon those people and those churches and our fellowship. Let's all stand across the building. The altars are open. You come forward, find a place to pray. Seal these things with God this morning. Any of those three messages, uh, maybe others besides, God's dealing with you about something else. You come forward, find a place to pray and seal these things with God this morning. Amen. Hallelujah. Oh, hail King Jesus. Clap offering as our brother comes this morning.